In this chapter, we move on to discussing what's called dividing the key. And dividing the key is a means by which you can very easily uh, determine what you can do with the key that you have in terms of creating um, changes. And it's directly related to what we were just talking about when it comes to expansion specification. And I think what we've done is perhaps put the harder part first to grasp, and then we can take our foot off the throttle a little bit and breathe a little bit and then take a look at this concept of dividing the key. How you determine an expansion specification is something that you have to know how to create one, but you have to know from what it's created and temper that against the fact, uh, temper that against is what you want possible. And dividing the key is the root way, I think, to figure out is that possible. The 1, 340, the 1, 660, all the examples that we just went through. Dividing the key is the shortcut math in terms of how that's done. <clears throat> and basically it is envision the key in your mind's eye. You know, Schlage six pin system we're doing. Envision all of those six cuts. Now you know what you can do from each of those cuts or each of those chambers. Dividing the key allows you to answer the question, <clears throat> can I build the quantity of levels necessary? Can I get enough change keys? Can I get enough masters? Can I get enough grandmasters? Can I get enough great grandmasters? The dividing the key allows you to do that. In basic locksmithing, this is by no means basic locksmithing, but this strata of locksmithing is foundational to much higher advanced skills. Um, everything that we're gonna we, we're talking about in this primer is required to know to understand. Approaching the more advanced stuff is is uh, unnecessary unless you have this base understanding. So dividing the key is the way to visualize the expansion specification. It allows us to see it in a very elegant, simple format. And I think the best thing to do now is we'll switch to the screen view and then we'll go through the chapter and we'll, we'll read it and talk over it. That's what we'll do now. Okay, so here starts our chapter on dividing the key. And let's just dive into it. So dividing the key is how we visualize our expansion specification. While dividing the key, so dividing the key is how we visualize, visualize our expansion specification. While dividing the key has not been taught at Aloha, I understand, since about 2008, for the door and hardware people, it makes understanding the, expense of, uh, the expansion specification uh, as it relates to the physical cylinder, simple to understand, and this tool can be used in seconds to know your answer. Every chamber, what are we trying to answer? Can you do what your customer wants to do on the platform of locks that you're working on? Every chamber of the cylinder will be purposefully used and assigned to provide changes at the particular, particular level you designate. So every chamber of the cylinder will be purposefully used and assigned to provide changes at the level that you designate. You're going to pull these chambers out and you're going to assign them to a particular level. Think of a six pin blank key in your mind's eye. Every cut position designated by an X as seen here. Um, I definitely did not make up this type of chart. I don't know that it exists exactly like this elsewhere, but, you know, just trying to, in my attempt to try to explain and visualize the concept of dividing the key, I've started with, imagine this table is your key. You've got six chambers. Imagine each X is a chamber and, you know, the cuts that would go with that chamber. 
Every cut position designated by an X as seen here allows you to harvest or produce or yield changes, whatever adjective you like. You must assign the quantity of biddings you need for each level, excluding the top level, by using up chambers. So you must assign the quantity of biddings you need for each level. So at the change key level, at the master key level, whatever the level is. You must assign chambers to each level, excluding the top level. The TMK doesn't use up any chambers. Just for fun, in a single step system, I'm sorry, back up, way back up. Numbers you will see repeat are 4, 16, 64, 256, 1024, and 496, 4,096. 4, These are powers of four. Just for fun, in a single step system, as we just talked about, 525, 125, 625, 3125, um, 15625, and then if you've got a seven pin cylinder, 78125. Let's dive in for a closer look. So I've redrawn, I have redrawn the table above, showing how you can divide the key based on how many master keys and change keys we can yield. We're sticking in our three level system. This is done by drawing a vertical line in our mind's eye at some point on the key. I've drawn a vertical line between chambers one and two. This example means that MKs equal master key and CKs equal change keys. So what I've done is I've taken this same chart and I've drawn a line between chambers one and two right here. We already know if I progress one chamber, I will get four changes, if you recall. Okay, I'll get four. If I progress one chamber for master keys, I will be progressing five chambers for change keys if I need. Set another way, let's start with change keys. I want, I need uh, up to, but not more than, 1,024 change keys. I would need to progress five chambers for that. But what we're doing in this example is we're just starting with one chamber. I suppose I could have started over here and shown you four changes and 1024 masters. But it's a little easier to understand change keys on the right and master keys on the left. doesn't have to be that way. It can be any way you want. You can put master keys here or change keys here, which, whichever. The point of the matter is this. If we designate a chamber to a level, you're going to be fixed in terms of how many keys you can harvest from that. If your expansion specification calls out for one, two, three, or four masters, you only have to designate one chamber. In this example, it would leave you with 1,024 possible biddings for change keys. Okay, As you can see, if we draw our line between chambers one and two, we can produce up to four master keys when we dedicate one pin chamber to master keys, and up to 1,024 change keys when we dedicate five pin chambers to change keys. This would be an unusual system. Um, I would think it would be four master keys with over a thousand change keys. And again, under each of the masters. Okay. So. This would be, this would be an unusual system. Okay. A more common way to divide the key might be between chambers two and three, as seen here. Extending our system out, if we were to dedicate two chambers to master keys, we can get 16. That means we're taking one away from the change keys, which means we're going to be reduced by a power of four, and we'll be left with up to 256 change keys. As you see, when we draw our line between chambers two and three, we can produce up to 16 masters. When we dedicate two chambers, two pin chambers to masters, and up to 256 change keys when we dedicate four pin chambers to change keys. If we take two for masters, we're only gonna be left with four chambers for change keys. Let's look at the other three ways to divide this. And this line is just gonna increase 
uh, keep moving to the right. If we divide between chambers three and four, you're going to get 64 masters and 64 change keys. We move over here, you can predict what's going to happen. We're going to have 256 masters and 16 change keys. And then finally, 1,024 masters and four change keys. So if someone says I need, you know, again, 36 change keys and I need, you know, five master keys, you can use the concept of visualizing the key or fall back on these tables and say to yourself, well, he said five masters and I think, what did I say, 36 change keys, whatever it is. If I need five masters, I can get that from two change from two um, chambers because I'll get up to 16. We know that we need more than four, so we've got to go to two chambers. So all of a sudden we're here. So if you need five masters, you're going to use two chambers, then you're going to have four left over for change keys. We said it was 36. So the point of the matter is you have way more masters and change keys that you would need. Um, in advanced topics, you would never use total position progression to do this work, but to get a base understanding of how to build on to more advanced topics, we're continuing with that. Speaking for myself, the purpose of illustrating how the key can be divided uh, using the above five examples makes it easier to visualize how much room you have in order to produce key systems. Okay. And bear with me one moment. Okay. Makes it easier to visualize how much room you have in order to produce key systems. The point being this, if your client asks for six masters and 10 changes under each master, can you do it? And if yes, where do you divide the key? You can divide the key at two or three, chambers two and three, or three and four, or four and five. You'll be able to get the quantity of masters and changes that you need. And that's called dividing the key. Now, just to get advanced for a real quick, crazy second, this is going to handle a three level system because your TMK doesn't take up part, yeah, your TMK does not take up any chambers. It sits alone, it doesn't use any real estate. That's a three level system. Let's say we had a four level system. We had a great grandmaster. The top key, the TMK, won't use up any chambers. But they said, I want a top, I want a great grandmaster, I want two grandmasters. I want four masters and I want 48 change keys. So what I just said was one chamber would be used for grandmasters. One chamber would be used for masters. And then you would have four chambers left over, which you would only need three chambers. So you'd still have a spare chamber. So dividing the key works for a four level system easily as well. As long as each level of keys and the quantity that as long as the quantity of keys that you require at each level can physically be accommodated by the absolute restri uh, restrictions of what a key can produce, which is based on how many pins and how many progression possibilities, meaning how many cuts are in each chamber that are available to you to progress for possible change keys. If you've got the real estate to do that, you can do it. You know, for that matter, you can do a seven level system here, you know, um, change keys, master keys, grand master keys, great grand masters, great, great grand master keys, great, great, great grand master keys, and a great, 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 great grand master up here. As long as you didn't need more than four changes at each level, you could do a seven level system here. Who, who why would you need such a thing? Um, the, it's just an illustration, I guess. Using the above visual examples allows you to immediately know if you can or cannot accommodate the client's requirements. How about needing 17 masters and 65 changes? Can you do that? We know that with 17 masters, we're going to need three chambers. And we know that with 65 changes, we're going to need four chambers. Well, you can't do it in a six pin uh, length key. You don't have enough chambers, but you can in a seven pin. Um, for masters, you would need three, and for changes, you would need four chambers. You cannot do this unless you have a seven-pin cylinder, which Schlage does not make. 
and um, multiplex keyways going in between and key elevations or using other advanced techniques in a six pin environment. So what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say there is you can do it, but you need to either have a longer key based on the knowledge that we've gained so far, or you need positively advanced techniques um, in order to pull that off. The summary, though, is simply put, dividing the key allows you to quickly re, uh, visualize if the expansion specification can be accommodated. Recall in a two-step system, progressing one, progressing one chamber gives you four change keys. Progressing two chambers gives you 16 keys and so on. Dividing the key allows you to visualize in a snapshot how much room you have available to extract change keys, master keys, and so on. To visualize dividing the key, let's look at this six-pin two-step example as seen here. It's just another way to look at this. Let's think back to our earlier expansion specification. If you recall, we're working with a 1340, but realized after speaking to the client, a 1660 would more accurately reflect the pot potential future needs as well. How do we apply the expansion specification to dividing the key? Let's start with the 60 part of the expansion specification. If you're still thinking of that same six pin key blank in your head, and looking at the table above, you see progressing one chamber gives you four. You need 60. Therefore, one chamber will not give enough. Will progressing two chambers work? No, it's only 16. Grab another chamber. Now you've got it. You can do up to 64. Is this adequate? Sure it is. Assuming we're going to use chambers four, five, and six uh, for master keys, it's going to start to look like this, used for changes. You have used three chambers, four, five, and six, and six, in fact, of your six pin key blank and still have three chambers untouched. Chambers one, two, and three. Let's move on to the second part of the expansion specification, which was the six in the one, six, sixty. You need six master keys. And you now know you cannot get six master keys from one chamber, as it gives you only four. So therefore, you need two chambers to produce 16 change keys. Uh, pardon me, to produce 16 master keys. Assuming we will use chambers one and two, we can use any of the remaining. You can use one and two, one and three, um, or, or two and three. One and two, one and three, or two and three. Um, you can use any, uh, our table will now look like this. There you go. Dividing the key. You can now see from the table above how it is easier to visualize how much real estate on the physical key you used up to accommodate your client's expansion specification. You might also see you can violate the possibilities of providing what your client requests by understanding this model. If an expansion specification cannot be realized on the physical key, you have to go through, you have to figure out how it'll be done. You'll probably work with the factory on, on those options. Let's run a scenario. Looking at the above and pretending I am the client, can you give me 11664? Sure you can. It's the same thing that we're doing right here. The same way you can give me one five seventeen. I need two chambers for five, and I need uh, three chambers for seventeen. You must work within these factors of four, and that's the powerful understanding to take away. If you need just one more change key than a single chamber allows, meaning the seventeen, you need only one more cut key than what if what two chambers will allow. You must use an entire additional chamber. Even though you only need one more change key, you, you have to use all of that chamber as the entire chamber gets consumed and not just part of a vertical column of progression. Therefore, you are cons oops. Therefore, you are consuming as much as the physical key, so to speak, regardless if I'm asking for 17 or 64 changes. 
Any number greater than 16 and 64 or less is the same loss of part of the key bidding array. You are still consuming an, an entire three chambers without employing advanced locksmithing techniques that, in my opinion, you ought not feel it required to possess. What I have just stated can be considered a rule, meaning everything we just talked about, accept it on fact, accept it on faith, accept that there are advanced techniques that can shred this in terms of reality and allow you to do wizard sort of tasks, wizardry with some of these teachers. Um, to stretch our capabilities further, can you give me 117, 100? Nope, not with a six pin blank. You would need three chambers for the 17 and four chambers for the 100. Okay, that's what we just went over. Will the customer switch to a seven pin system? Maybe. If yes, you can do it. Or maybe a single step system. A uh, single step system, system would definitely work. Let's amend that. And uh, and the problem with going with a seven pin or a single step system, you're not going to be using Schlage. You're going to be selling your client all new locks. That could be impossible. Okay, to put a capstone on our dividing the key conversation. Everything above is based on an understanding that we are considering the development of keys using total position progression. And that dividing the key is helpful to visualize the expansion specification, which comes from the keying conference. At some point, someone's going to ask you, hey, uh, this is how I want them keyed. Is that going to work? More likely, it's going to be in the specifications, and you're going to be obligated to provide that. If you understand all that preceded, you are in a far stronger position to advocate on your client's behalf to ensure you are providing the fullest solutions available to your client and making healthy sales along the way. I have mentioned, uh, and here's the asterisk, I've mentioned total position progression, known as TPP, without an explanation. This is a system by which biddings are derived... where you accept the fact that each and every chamber will have a master pin loaded in the chamber. Okay, Having a master pin in every chamber is the defining characteristic of total position progression. TPP is industry standard when it comes to very large keying systems and systems greater than three levels. To really confuse you further, TPP is not the preferred method for smaller systems, and later in this work we will show you why this is. It bears saying again, as it turns out, TPP is usually not the best choice when creating a keying system. So why discuss it? Well, because TD, TPP and its odometer approach is easiest, in my opinion, to understand from a beginner's point of view. If you were on an island by yourself and you were inventing in your head how to pin cylinders, you would probably think about putting a master key in every chamber and you would probably think about an odometer um, which I said earlier is the eureka moment that I had um, we will discuss other methods of progression later known as limited position progression rotating constant uh, later in this primer which are quite likely superior choices when it comes to methods of progression I would go so far as to say that they're almost always superior to total position progression. And you're going to learn why. Also, the above expansion specification example we used is called symmetrical expansion, which we talked on, talked about. That means that you have a TMK with six master keys under it. And under each of the six masters, you have 60 change keys under it. Yes, each and every one of the six masters, again, gets its own 60 change keys. I state this as there is no, pardon me, I state this as there is also an asymmetrical expansion specification where masters may not have an equal number of change keys.
to just touch on asymmetrical again, which we did just in the previous chapter, your 1660 might actually need four master keys with four changes under, under it, one master key with 16, and then one master key with 60. That's asymmetrical. You've got a different quantity of change keys under each master key. This is asymmetric expansion. That asymmetric expansion specification would look like the following. 1, 4, 4, 1, 16, 1, 60. For the reading on asymmetric, as I said, Jerome Andrew's CML book, Fundamentals of Master Keying. Um, a point worth, again, reinforcing. Remember, the TMK does not consume any chambers. It is accounted for by not... It is accounted for by not, meaning excluding using its biddings in the KBA progression, meaning in your key bidding array, none of the cuts of the top key will be in the progression possibilities. You are accounting for the TMK because you're not using its cuts in the key bidding array. That's how that's allotted for. Okay, Let's wrap up this chapter on the camera. Now, I took the DHI class on Master King. I forget the title of the course. It's, of course, still taught. And dividing the key was definitely a part of that class. And I'm glad that it was because I think that it's an easy way to go about learning, you know, how to get from where you are to where you need to be. Your role is to be able to translate as accurately as possible the needs of the client to the factory. The client and the factory, I mean, we all know that they talk to each other. They, they do, you know, on, you know, certain clients are direct with the factory. Um, but in contract hardware, you know, you're, you're the intermediary. Your ability to be able to convey to the factory what the needs are is, can be the difference between total disaster and total success. Um, and the more that you can know about the science behind everything that the factory already understands after having having a keying conference with a customer who likely knows nothing about it or during the process of explaining to you what they want they only serve to confuse you further i've i've had early on when i would be attempting to digest what the client wants I would get so confused. I would have almost no idea. What, what, stop, start over. What? I'd have to put it out into my own terminology. But as I gain knowledge of the mechanical process of pinning cylinders and how that those parts could only be put together, it allowed me to say, hold on, stop. And as the customer's giving me all the information, I'm putting it into the way in which I know the universe of, of cylinders has to work. So the point is, is the more you know about this, the more successful you'll be at that intermediary role in doing so quite successfully. Okay, we're going to go on to understanding the KBA. So we've put a, we've talked a lot about an important subject before actually getting to it. And I did want a baptism by fire to a certain extent. And we're going to go on to understanding the KBA. I will probably, um, who knows what we'll do. So let's, let's jump into that next.